So suggestions for um, open up your playing if you're in a rut of some type. So okay, that happens to me all the time. I'm sad as hell. So I'm always trying to figure out something. So uh, some things that I figured out uh, for myself is number one, when you're on the bandstand play, make sure you do something that you know you cannot do. Go for that immediately first. All right. Um, I do that all the time. I just go for it. So basically, you want to get yourself in a position that, that you have to get yourself out of. You will definitely not play some stuff that, uh, that you're usually used to doing. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is try playing where you must listen. In other words, concentrate on somebody else in the band. Let's say I usually compartmentalize. So let's say listen to the guitar player or the piano player or the bass player or the drummer. Or if you're one of those instruments, listen to the saxophone player, the trumpet player. Uh, and when you're playing a solo, uh, make sure that you you wait and take. So just don't don't even play yet. First, you start. You wait and take. You cannot play anything unless you get some information from somebody else. Take that idea and develop it. Whatever it is, it could be melodic, harmonic, or rhythmic. All right, be specific. Uh, take it and play it work on it in other words develop it until it dissipates when it dissipates don't play any more shit maybe i shouldn't have said that uh wait until you get some more information from someone else then do it again all right but always be willing to uh, not have to fill up space wait until you have some valid uh, information or content and then develop and then wait till you get something from someone else not from yourself it must be from someone else so that's another thing to do. Another thing to do is this, I kind of tell people this, play a three chord solo. Uh, basically it starts from very little to uh, more and more content at the end. First chorus, half notes and whole notes only, nothing more. Uh, you can play eighth notes, for example, if they're like grace notes to a whole note or half note, but no consecutive eighth notes, no consecutive quarter notes either. Second chorus, you can add quarter notes. Third chorus, first half of the chorus, you can add eighth notes. Uh, and then last half of, the, half of the chorus, you can add sixteenth notes. So that's another thing to do. Um, and of course, you can add triplets of any of those gradations, but you have to make sure you follow that information. And you must make it, try to make an interesting solo with those things. Only three choruses, no more, no playing forever. Must be that. All right, so those are three things to try. So what is my approach to composition? Um, I'm still adding quite a bit to that um, category, but at this point, um, the things that I, I do are, um, basically, I, I usually I tend to write for people I'm starting to get out of that, but generally I write for people. Um, and um, one other thing about writing is, let's say for for melody. So most of the time, I've been recently it's been writing uh, chordless music. So my music tends to be voice led. In other words, um, uh, whether it's two voices or three voices. Um, the melody and the other voices I, are written sim simultaneously. In other words, I don't write a melody, tend not to write a melody, and then harmonize it. It usually happens all at the same time. Although now I'm starting to change that a little bit to see what that produces, and it does produce slightly different results. Um, the other thing is that um, uh, I tend to write with voice leading, one, just to, to uh, um, just to help me with writing stronger melodies. When I say strong melody, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's aesthetically beautiful and perfect and everyone will like it or anything like that. It just means that the melody relative to the chords, especially relative to the bass and the other no notes, um, what can I say, uh, has a, a strong and clear purpose and that there is usually some amount of forward motion, meaning from one note you, want, you tend to want to hear the next one. Um, and usually every note has some amount of vibrancy. Um, so uh, the other thing is I, t I tend to write with voice leading 
also just to, um, uh, how can I put it, um, and with, with, uh, without chords first because uh, the, the voice leading and particularly the melody itself must be strong on its own merits. Um, because um, without that, let's say if you're playing a melody without chords, um, the melody, the melody itself, um, in conjunction with the other two lines, uh, must be strong and have some purpose. Otherwise, the melody will not sound, and the chords will not sound without that. If you have chords, um, then you're, f in some sense, you're freer to write any melody that you want, because the chords will always be there. If you don't have that, then the voice leading in the melody uh, must be clear because you won't hear the chords without that. So much of my writing has to do with that. So I can, it uh, helps uh, me get stronger to hear uh, strong voice leading and strong melodies. So that when, when I start to add chords, it's much easier actually to write with chords. So uh, that's one thing. The other thing is writing without chords has helped me to figure out how to deal with form because when you have fewer when you don't have chords i find that that the form is tends to be more important because you have to create some kind of a interest uh, when you don't have chords you have to find some way to make things feel like they're moving forward resting uh, create events without chords. When you have chords, sometimes the rhythm section cr can create events without even a melody going on. So when you don't have chords, there's, there's, there's rhythm and melody. There's a lot more emptiness. So you have to, it helps, you don't have to, but it helps to have a form that creates some tension or some release. So uh, that's another thing that, that I've gotten into for, um, by writing without chords. Um, so anyway, I spend a lot of time on form um, and what the form will do to the melody and the chords and the rhythm. Uh, and the other thing is I think about tempos, you know, what, what needs to be written at this tempo and what kind of format. When I say format, I mean type of form and uh, type of rhythm. So it might be like um, if you have a tune that has a vamp in the beginning, so there are a lot of tunes like that. Uh, and then uh, a melody of some type, um, and then maybe another vamp. Or maybe you have a uh, tune that has melody, let's say A, A, B, A, then C, and then maybe an interlude. Or do you want something that has, uh, playing at a certain tempo, then the tempo slows down, and it speeds up to another tempo. Or do you want a tune that has starts at a given tempo, has an interlude that might be out of time and then starts the tempo again, so on and so forth. They all do different things. So sometimes I might try writing uh, as a template. Let's say uh, I take a format of a given tune. It might even be a tune that I have or a tune that someone else uh, wrote, and I use that format. Uh, but maybe I'll, I'll change the melody and change the harmony just to see what happens as a template. And then I might start, start to change little bits of the form. So uh, I find that method to be fairly useful. It's just taking the format. So format mean, mean, meaning the form, but it can also mean the format meaning format is a little, a little more um, open. So let's say if you take the exact form, let's say 32-bar form, A, A, B, A. So the format, if you say, take the format, it would mean maybe uh, a, 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 B, A, but not the exact same amount of bars as the original tune. So it might not be 32 bars. It might be like uh, 10 bars, 10 bars, 5 bars, and then 10 bars. You know, or you can think like A, A, B, and then A, 1. So maybe 10 bars, 10 bars, 5 bars, and then the last would be, let's say, you know, 8 bars or 12 bars. So the format is the same, meaning they're there are four sections, but the, the amount of bars might change. So, or let's say the format is like A, A, B, interlude, uh, A. So then you work with that format. So anyway, so there are a lot of different formats. And also the format might mean, when I say format, I also mean like a, the type of rhythm. There might be, let's say it's 
it might be in a certain uh, certain clave that you keep. So you keep the same clave as some tune that you liked, or some uh, some uh, rhythmic pattern or something like that. So anyway, there are plenty of other things that I do, but that's a basic idea. <laughs> Growing with, um, I'd say Kurt and I and Ben and Jeff actually as a band grew together. So, uh, just I just wanted to point that out that the our growing together as musicians um, wouldn't have happened without all four of us. Actually, it wasn't just us two. Maybe it's just us two because we're frontline instruments and all that. But I just want to point that out. The other th the thing, other thing is that uh, yeah, it was it was a was and is a. a incredible experience, at least from my point of view, um, because that was, for me, that was right when I was, um, you know, it was, a, it was a formative period. I mean, it's formative for your entire life, I'll say for myself, but that period was very important. Um, and what we did was, during that time, we were in town a lot, because we didn't have a whole lot of gigs, we had enough to live, but uh, we, were, we were playing at Smalls, I think maybe that was, might have been going on for I think that was around 94, 95, 96, maybe even into 97. Uh, and we would play there for, you know, every week. I think we had Tuesdays, um, maybe, I don't remember, but for three, six months at a time. And we would go to Kurt's place. At that time, uh, Kurt and Ben were roommates, and we'd go over there and rehearse. You know, and we just, one was just rehearsing Kurt's tunes. At first we played a combination of Kurt's tunes and, um, and some standards. And, and then we were playing more and more of Kurt's tunes and he was writing more music uh, based on just the way we were, we were all playing together. And, you know, we were, at the time we were trying to sort of maybe reconcile isn't the word, but a lot of different kinds of language because that we all loved. So. A lot of maybe say traditional language, maybe it's not traditional as the word, but you know, music from the bebop era and from the music from the 60s, um, 60s meaning more mainstream era, and then also music from the 70s. Let's say, for example, Keith, Keith Jarrett's band, uh, American Quartet in the 70s, uh, you know, Ornette in the 70s and in the 60s, uh, Paul Blay, people like that as well as, uh, you know, let's say maybe like Zawinul, uh, Weather Report, um, other, uh, other free and avant-garde music in, that, in the 70s, and as well as, like I was saying earlier, music like, let's say, you know, Bud Powell, Charlie Parker, um, Fast Navarro, Miles Davis, you know, John Coltrane, um, uh, um, you know, a lot of bands, this, I can keep going on, but let's say, you know, Thelonious Monk, uh, Miles in the 60s, so on and so forth. So all this kind of music, we're trying to figure out how to put it together in our language and put it together in a place that, at least for us, maybe wasn't put together as much. I think it always has, but we just were trying to figure out our way to do it. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, and we're, we're also, I think there was a connection that we had, maybe because we all loved similar, the same music, and um, we were trying to maybe figure out how to do it while playing standards and also playing original music too, and keep those so that, in my view, maybe so we're trying to keep those so they were not so far apart, like we're trying, playing tunes, now we're playing our music. We were trying to keep it all in the same, um, the same lore, the same tradition, the same line, you know, uh, in the same way that the masters did. So that's a short answer to your question. Mm -hmm. 